We can now bring in Peter Zalmayev, director of the Eurasian Democracy Initiative, uh, who joins us from Kiev. Thank you very much for joining us here on uh, France 24. Is this a loss for Moscow or simply a new Russian strategy? It's a huge loss, no matter how you cut it. Uh, for symbolic reasons, you know, if you remember four weeks ago, Vladimir Putin, to a great fanfare, announced this annexation of four regions. Kherson was the crown jewel in, uh, jewel in this new uh, round of annexations as the only regional capital that Russia has been able to capture since the start of the war on, uh, in, in uh, February. Uh, and also, it, militarily, this puts pretty much an end to Russia's uh, plans to uh, conquer Mykolaiv further to the west and Odessa, Odessa, which you know is considered by Russians as a, as a city of Russian glory, you know, which was founded by Catherine the Great, whose monument, by the way, is being toppled almost as we speak now in Odessa. So this is a tremendous, tremendous, uh, you know, loss which the Russian propaganda is trying to spin as a necessary military maneuver, but it's it becomes at a very precarious time. For Vladimir Putin and his right-wing opposition, his uh, if if you can call it that, the right you know the party of war in Telegram channels, etc. He is calling it none other than the greatest geopolitical uh, defeat since the breakup of the Soviet Union. What can we expect to see on the battlefield over in the next few months? Given that we're already in what the middle of November now and winter is coming. Winter is coming. It's going to be much uh, more difficult, obviously, for Ukraine to continue advancing in that direction further beyond Kherson, because beyond Kherson is the Dnieper River, a very wide river, and uh, trying to wade it, trying to cross it with the mass of Russian troops on the other side is going to be pretty much suicidal, and I don't think Ukraine is going to do that. What we're uh, seeing indications from the Russian side that they're going to relocate these retreating troops uh, to the Donbass. Uh, and, you know, boost the uh, military effort there. This is probably the one spot in Ukraine where Russians have the greatest chance of having some success and reconquering the rest of the Donbass. Since this announcement of a retreat indicates that Ukraine has the upper hand on the battlefield, should there not be a push for, for dialogue now? This is what we're hearing in Russia. The Russian side is... Russian media is playing up uh, reports uh, that uh, Washington is uh, you know, supposedly uh, forcing Ukraine to the negotiating table. And in fact, this retreat, you know, some are portraying this retreat as sort of an, a part of the agreement between Biden and Putin, whereby uh, the Russians have left her son. This is an opportunity to sit down, talk and try to come to some kind of a, a peace agreement. Well, you know, we'll have to see how Ukrainians react to the retreating Russian troops, if they fire on them, if they try to kill as many of them as possible and get uh, as much equipment uh, as possible from the retreating troops, I don't think then that that makes uh, any sense. And, you know, when we talk about a peace agreement, you have to keep in mind that Vladimir Putin has not given up on his goal of destroying Ukraine. If he cannot control it, then he would rather destroy it. And so any peace agreement is fraught with the possibility that Russia will only use it to uh, freeze military reaction, to regroup, uh, and in order to, to freshen up their troops and attack and attack and attack again. In the last few days, we've seen a softening of Vladimir Zelensky's language because I know he's passed a law there where you are saying that he will not be negotiating with any Russian president. Uh, I mean, if Putin is a president, he will not be negotiating with him. That seems to have changed in recent days. What conditions, in your opinion, will Kiev allow? We know that apparently Kiev is being nudged on by Washington to, to be open to the possibility of talks. What conditions will be okay for most Ukrainians to say, okay, now is the time to negotiate. Well, first of all, they have to stop this terror in the skies, and they have to stop these uh, the drone attacks on our civilian infrastructure. Russia is said to be in talks with Iran to buy ballistic missiles. It has already knocked out about 30 to 40 percent of our electricity grid, uh, so that obviously has to stop. Uh, uh, then there's obviously the cons you know the the demand for for the Russians to retreat. Uh, at least to the pre-February 24th borders, if not, you know, 1991 borders. Yeah, because that's Ukraine. the thing. We seem to get uh, different uh, dates uh, often, whether it's the 1991 borders or or uh, the February borders, because right. that would mean them leaving Crimea as well. 
And I could take. Uh, let, let me just say something. This is not something even that is discussed publicly. This is kind of considered sacrilegious because the goal is now to liberate all of Ukraine's territory. But if we're talking about the peace peace talks that you have asked me about, I think this could be a, a dual format. Uh, Crimea could potentially be frozen. I don't think we can expect the Ukrainian side to sign off on you on Crimea. But for the purpose of a, of, of true peace talks, that could be frozen, and the part of the Donbass occupied since 19, uh, 2014 can be frozen. You know, No matter what peace talks ever are conducted, another very important, crucial component is what do we do with rebuilding Ukraine? Ukraine has suffered a damage to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars, and obviously, uh, you know, Russia should be the one who has to pay. So we have to consider the question of reparations. That should be an element in any peace talks going forward. Peter Zamev, uh, great talking to you on the program today. Thank you.